Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this IEA uh, lunchtime session. Um, we have an interesting one, a very topical one this afternoon for you. Um, this is on building European cyber resilience through defence and diplomacy. Um, that alone is a topical, it's an extremely dynamic and interesting aspect of, of international and security policy at the moment, and one that is obviously of extreme interest to many people in Ireland given recent events. Um, my name is Richard Brown, I'm the Acting Director of the National Cyber Security Centre in Ireland. Um, many, will, many of you will know me, I've been involved in cyber security here for, for many years. Um, we have a very interesting group of speakers today. Um, to begin with, uh, we have either, but the order may change, we have uh, Victor Saniecki, who's the Deputy Head of Mission in the European External Action Service. Um, Victor is going to speak to us about the, um, about the European, uh, sorry, European Cyber Security Strategy and the developing work of the EAAS around Europe's security and diplomatic posture on cyber, secure, on cyber matters. Um, the EAS and the European Union indeed have developed a really interesting set of tools, including a cybersecurity toolbox, for use in proposing, pushing, developing a European uh, consciousness and presence on the international stage around cybersecurity. And it's been extremely useful and interesting for us as a state to engage with. Um, but to begin with, uh, and welcome Ambassador, we will have Ambassador Haile Tirma Klar, who is the ambassador at large for cyber, cyber diplomacy in the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Hali has been centrally involved in, Est in Estonia is building its presence and indeed the European presence uh, at the Security Council and other levels across the European Union in pushing and developing um, for a much more expansive, broader and deeper consideration of cybersecurity as a global security and geopolitical question. Now, Ambassador, I'm sorry to to jump to you straight away, but well, the way we're going to do this is Ambassador is going to speak first for seven to 10 minutes, followed by Victor, and then we're going to have a conversation. I'll have, I have some questions of my own and we'll take questions from the audience. Obviously, and I'm sure everybody will be aware, both the initial address and the Q&A session are going to be recorded and on the record, unless otherwise stated. Um, anybody who has a question, please feel free to submit it via the, the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, when you're doing so, please identify yourself and your affiliation when you're asking a question. Um, and of course, if anybody wants to engage with the conversation on social media, please feel free to tweet using the handle at IIEA as ever. Um, and let's go, Ambassador, please. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, hello, Victor. And, um, and hello, everyone uh, in the call uh, whom we cannot see. So I see 44 participants. So. Um, I'll, I'll speak a bit uh, why uh, Estonia has been raising cyber uh, issue in all international organizations and, uh, 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 and what it actually now um, looks like uh, in terms of um, international awareness and also then I'll talk about European um, um, cyber policies and um, as they have evolved and uh, what challenges we will face in the future. Um, yes, Estonia certainly was one of the first countries to start raising the cyber issues uh, in different international organizations. I think the first for us was uh, NATO. Uh, NATO came up with its first cyber defense policy as early as 2008, uh, with a su su subsequent policy in 2011, 2014, and now in 2021, it's, uh, it's the latest NATO policy in, in force. Uh, then um, the second organization that uh, was quite uh, quickly taking up cyber issues was uh, uh, OSCE. Uh, already as early as 2009, the OSCE had uh, put together the um, working group on cyber issues uh, that started to discuss the regional confidence building measures. And it was also related with the United Nations group of governmental experts, which then convened and, uh, and had its first report. produced uh, in the first confidence building measures discussion started in the OSD. And in 2013, the first set of the confidence building measures was um, adopted in, uh, in the OSC. Um, the European Union uh, um, started a bit later with all these um, uh, policy development issues, uh, uh, with horizontal policies. Um, uh, the EU has been doing um, something on the cybercrime issues, uh, a bit of critical infrastructure protection, bits and pieces here and there prior to the 2013 cyber um, uh, security strategy of the European Union, which was the first horizontal EU strategy that has taken together 
all the free billars, as they were uh, called before the Lisbon Treaty. The uh, internal um, market, uh, justice, home affairs, and also security and defense policy. So uh, the 2013 strategy uh, fo was followed with the 2017 uh, strategy, and also the third strategy has been produced by the European Union in 2020. So. Uh, all in all, we see that in different major international organizations, there is a now the cyber policy posture, which uh, helps governments to talk to each other, which also um, um, cyber normative framework or international law applying in cyberspace, or it helps with the regional integration, like in the case of, of the European Union, or it helps with uh, the preparations for um, cyber defense, as, as NATO has been uh, doing. So uh, I think um, all the different elements of our global cyber normative framework are now in place. So we have the UN agreement that uh, um, international law applies in cyberspace, that we all should uh, implement the norms of responsible state behavior. Uh, we have different uh, regional organizations uh, uh, now uh, having the confidence building measures and, and we have to implement the confidence building measures and have to follow those confidence building measures. And of course, we, we have um, uh, the whole set of rules and, and standards and different other elements in our uh, international normative framework also on the technical side. And this, I think the EU is quite good at uh, setting the technical standards for its um, uh, critical infrastructure protection and cyber resilience in all EU member states with the NIS directive, um, network and information security directive, and with other um, internal market related um, uh, policy bits, the EU has been able really to raise the overall resilience of all European Union member states. So, And of course, also quite valuable uh, in the EU cyber posture is uh, cyber diplomacy toolbox, uh, which the EAS is uh, leading in the European Union. And of course, Victor will talk about this. So I'll, I will not uh, go and elaborate on that one because it shows also that the EU is not just an economic standard setting agency uh, for its member states, but it also can uh, um, ne negotiate a coordinated member states position vis-a-vis -vis third countries and also show response to malicious cyber activities. So it has raised and the EU significance also to the political uh, level uh, in terms of global cyber politics or international cyber policy and international relations. So, but um, maybe maybe I'll I'll just uh, uh, spend one or two minutes uh, telling us what are the challenges now, because we have reached um, maybe the first uh, maturity level or maybe second maturity level. It depends uh, where you sit. I think. Uh, uh, in overall uh, cyber policy posture um, in Europe, uh, but it um, still uh, uh, needs some work before we can say that, yes, we have now built the proper cyber resilience and, and we can um, basically um, just sit back and, um, and not worry about cyber issues anymore. So because I think um, we are in, in an interesting juncture where uh, mostly the government so far have done quite many efforts in order to uh, first to agree to create consensus. The most recent consensus creation in the United Nations First Committee is quite remarkable. We have a right um, to the consensus with two reports this spring, which is very unusual, I think, for cyber affairs globally, and that uh, suddenly there is um, a consensus uh, on both very uh, uh, sensitive uh, working groups. So uh, then, of course, Estonia has raised the uh, cyber issue to the United Nations Security Council, which is, I think, now in a way like um, the last frontier in terms of raising cyber as an important political body. So now it's all done. But um, but this is all very good. So the governments understand this is an issue. It's a strategic issue. It's a part of foreign and security policy. We have to pay attention. There are actually also many other actors in cyberspace, um, like the private sector, uh, critical, not just critical companies and um, infrastructure companies that are in charge of providing critical services, but also other companies. So, and now we see the non-state actors going after uh, different companies, 
were um, uh, with uh, recent ransomware attacks in, in the US and in Europe, we have seen also um, uh, quite a, a powerful impact on the citizen. Uh, and I think now we are uh, facing the new and quite important challenge as well uh, to make sure that uh, we are collectively um, going to curb um, the phenomenon of global cybercrime and, and making sure that uh, all the disruptions uh, and non-state actor um, element in our cyber instability is going to be diminished. And I think this is also the niche where the European countries and European Union actually have a very great role because the capacity building that um, EU uh, nations and also the EU as such as an uh, organization can do globally in order to make sure that there is rule of law uh, in all corners of the world, the cyber criminals have no safe heavens, and, and we help the law enforcement, we help also uh, the ju criminal justice system in, in all the countries in the world. I think this is, this is also very important. And of course, also enhancing our own information sharing and cooperation uh, to face uh, cyber um, threats, which seem to be now um, um, proliferating. Not, and, and we are still talking, of, of course, about the state-sponsored or state-organized malicious activities. But I think increasingly we see the new actors in this field that can also um, create uh, serious disruptions and, and those non-state actors also are increasingly a concern for us. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you for that. It was a very interesting introduction. Um, we'll pass straight over to, to Victor and then we'll, we'll come back with questions immediately afterwards. Perfect, many thanks. Uh, thanks Richard and uh, Ellie, it's always a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to be at the stage uh, together with you. And I think that you know you built a, a, a sort of a, you've given me with uh, with your last part especially a very nice segue to uh, to also build a little bit more on uh, on a sort of uh, a context or or geostrategic uh, uh, situation that we are in. And it's clear uh, also from our perspective uh, in the EAS uh, and uh, from the European Union perspective is that that uh, you know the the, the relation or international relations. Uh, in cyberspace, in a way, so to say, mirror uh, the uh, the challenges and opportunities of uh, of uh, of the real world, the multipolar uh, world, and geopolitical tensions, including uh, as well, unfortunately, attempts by some states to control and abuse technologies, are leading to uh, uh, increased uh, security threats, also a, a risk of fragmentation, and uh, and uh, in the sense of real world, also. Of paralyzing effective multilateralism. And these efforts uh, uh, to further control cyberspace, uh, I think in our view very often uh, uh, also uh, uh, could be a catalyst in a way uh, to uh, uh, increase the likelihood of a, of a conflict between the, the states. Um, some of these actors who are uh, um, in, in cyberspace, uh, do so because it largely reflects their domestic agendas, uh, uh, which centers around the authoritarian concept of cyber, cyber sovereignty, uh, which uh, should ensure the prerogative of uh, individual governments to control cyberspace used by their citizens. And this authoritarian vision of fragmenting cyberspace and internet in particular, and favoring stricter government control over cyberspace vis-a-vis -vis other stakeholders that Halley has mentioned, is getting a foothold as well in the multilateral system with more and more divisive proposals being put forward and with a lesser focus on finding compromises. Um, the more prominent examples to shift, uh, of the shift, uh, to shift the trajectory of the global open, free, stable and secure cyberspace are the push to launch legally binding instruments on both international security and cybercrime, to push restrictive standards, replace internet infrastructure, and also bring this infrastructure under the uh, uh, multilateral auspices. And these efforts oppose our EU vision of cyberspace, which is governed by multi-stakeholder model and respect of, uh, respectful of human rights and fundamental freedoms, supporting economic growth and ensuring international stability and security in cyberspace. As well, Halley mentioned that uh, the cyberspace, we see uh, that it's increasingly misused to conduct malicious cyber activities, uh, be it by state or non-state actors for various uh, 
uh, uh, reasons for political, financial, or economic gains in case of uh, um, uh, cyber espionage. And some sites are as well, unfortunately, not abiding by normative framework uh, that has been agreed in the United Nations that Harry mentioned, uh, which is the basis of recognition of applicability of international law and as well existence of, uh, of uh, norms for responsible state behavior. As well, misuse of technologies for malicious purposes is, you know, our view unacceptable and also uh, undermines international stability and security in cyberspace. And at the end of the day, creating really a loose situation, whereas I think we are really working towards the win-win situations. Helly mentioned on uh, uh, several occasions how we as the European Union approach this. Since 2013, we have strengthened our cyber diplomacy policies through uh, engagement both at the UN level, as well as through uh, EU cyber diplomacy toolbox uh, established in 2017, and uh, uh, our bilateral and regional engagements, notably, and Helly mentioned that as well, on cyber capacity building. And through cyber diplomacy efforts, uh, the EU and our member states actively contribute to the rules-based uh, order online and offline. With, um, let me turn now into uh, uh, very briefly uh, uh, into 2020 EU cybersecurity strategy, which has been the, the latest policy development. And we have through that provided a new impetus uh, to our cyber policies, both on the cyber diplomacy part, but also on the cyber defense. And, uh, and on the internal uh, 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 resilience elements, addressing different, uh, you know, and I think that it should allow us to increase uh, resilience of, uh, uh, of the European Union and our member states, leaders. in favor of the global and open cyberspace. And let me hear on that uh, element, since Ali mentioned, has mentioned uh, already work also in the United Nations work, a, a proposal that is a part of the 2020 EU cybersecurity strategy to establish a program of action to advance responsible state behavior, strengthening uh, and as well elements of strengthening the cyber diplomacy toolbox and our capacity building efforts and partnerships, which will directly contribute to international security and stability in cyberspace. I think I'll maybe stop here, Richard, in order to save uh, us more time for interactive uh, uh, Q&As and also Q and A's with, uh, with, uh, with the audience, but I'll be very happy to develop further a little bit on the uh, uh, cyber diplomacy toolbox uh, uh, elements and anything else you might uh, want to uh, um, uh, ask for. Victor, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, let's keep the questions coming in. We have some already, but, but I have a few to, to begin with. I think I might take Victor up and his offer of some extrapolation on the effectiveness of the cyber diplomacy toolbox. But I'll start with, with you, Ambassador, if you don't mind. Um, one of, and Victor made reference to this as well. Um, the idea of, of norms as a or creating or developing a global picture of norms for a, as a means of constraining state behavior um, and the responsible state behavior in cyberspace is something that is very heavily embedded in global cybersecurity thinking. Um, but you could be forgiven for, for thinking at this point in the process that there are some real limitations to that methodology. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, um, if, I think you are alluding to the question whether we need a binding treaty versus the non-binding politically uh, agreed norms. Well, let me do this uh, awareness raising bit why we cannot have cyber warfare treaty. So at this stage, we cannot... Uh, uh, go on with any of the binding elements because we are talking about the dual use domain here. So if, if it was nuclear weapons, it would be easy to count all the weapons because we know which countries are uh, enriching uranium and we certainly have an understanding which countries are developing nuclear weapons. So um, uh, uh, if there were um, conventional weapons, we could certainly count also tanks and artillery and soldiers. In cyberspace, which is very dual-use domain, 
we even if we had uh, something binding and um, I think it's it's um, yeah uh, an element that um, many people who are not familiar with cyber issues are usually asking as a first question um, why we don't have a treaty uh, we cannot have a treaty so that's a short answer because uh, uh, if we had a treaty uh, we would be fooling ourselves that this would be effective because we cannot verify it at this stage. Um, How thank you. can thank we you. verify the treaty? If we are going to uh, verify, then we have to be able to um, access all the laptops in the world and to see whether somebody has built cyber weapon with their uh, laptop. So, and, and this is this is one of the, uh, just the, uh, maybe the elements in cyber that um, is not uh, comparable with conventional um, uh, uh, disarmament. So the usual disarmament approach is not working in cyber. Uh, what works in cyber is the um, uh, regulation of behavior. Uh, so because we cannot regulate the arms, but we can regulate the behavior. And, and that's why we talk about the norms and uh, implementing the norms and, and also making sure that we uh, enforce the norms because if, if if the norms are not enforced, so what's the use of of the norms? And we know that many countries that have agreed to those eleven norms in 2015 already have broken those norms many times after the agreement on the norms. So it's true, but some countries also have not followed the binding international law. If you know there have been bombings of um, hospitals in Syria, it, which is clearly strongly against any um, uh, principle of the current international humanitarian law. So therefore, um, instead of uh, maybe the discussion whether we need a binding uh, treaty or whether we can go on with the norms, we have to think of um, the ways how we can uh, implement already uh, agreed and existing international law in cyberspace. And this is something what Estonia has been trying to do. Um, the, the Tallinn Center here, the NATO Center, has um, put together a um, few editions of uh, uh, academic analysis, what is called Tallinn Manual. The first manual was talking about um, implementation of um, the international law above the threshold of armed conflict, or IHL, or um, a law of armed conflict. So, uh, and the second edition talked about uh, international law below the arm threshold of armed conflict or international customary law. And now um, the NATO center here is embarking uh, to put together the first uh, um, edition of the Tallinn manual, which tries also to um, bind together the existing state practice and to um, analyze um, how the existing international law and the principles of existing international law apply. And the existing international law is binding. So we have the binding law already in cyberspace, which is the IHL, which is the customer international law, which just have to implement. Uh, Harry, yeah, thank you very I, much. I'm, yes, if, 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 if I, I, was actually, uh, I was actually going to jump in a little bit. Please uh, do. On on that, sorry, we, we were talking uh, talking at the same time, but I think that you know, Heli uh, uh, made a, of course a, a very uh, valid argument. Let me uh, uh, sort of augment it also with uh, with uh, with supporting one of, of very kind of you know real political uh, approaches as well. That if we launch negotiations in the in the current, especially multilateral context, where we have really very few um, uh, areas where we can agree on as the international community. On a, such a delicate and uh, and difficult topic as uh, as uh, uh, you know uh, um, UN treaty uh, on, uh, on on cyber, I think that we would be uh, also creating a possible situation where some of the actors will use it as the excuse of saying precisely the since we are working on a new uh, uh, treaty, the in that um, existing international law does not apply, and uh, there is a you know a basically we have uh, it gives us uh, 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 no accountability for actions whatsoever, and I think that it heightens the risk of uh, of uh, a miscalculation and 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 escalation in a way. So I think that this is very practical as well element of you know let's uh, let's uh, rather focus on as uh, Sally said as Heli said about 
promotion of norms about growing the awareness in the, uh, in the within the international community of already existing commitments and uh, and what those norms how they translate into practice and also uh, building uh, uh, building understanding and in, in interpretation of uh, of how the international law applies in cyberspace this will you know time will help as well with a growing uh, amount of so sort of jurisprudence and uh, and uh, cases that uh, that uh, will be more and more often i think that will help to clarify but also actions such as uh, Tallinn manuals uh, so now the third edition and uh, we as the european union we also uh, committed uh, to a deep interpretation of applicability of international law uh, uh, within the uh, uh, within the uh, last uh, update of uh, of strategy many of our member states have done it uh, that was a part of a call of a group of governmental experts and the uh, previous open-ended working group to uh, precisely uh, 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 entice and invite uh, uh, all the international uh, actors, uh, member states of the UN, to come up with national interpretations because it will help to bring transparency and clarity uh, as well to that uh, topic.